Today on the show, we are grabbing our multi-purpose spork eating utensils and chowing down on some <laughs> spiced Easter eggs. They are too spicy for off-worlders. Shishakli. Mm-mm-mm. Jeez. <laughs> so spicy. Leave us alone. <laughs> I actually love spicy food. I do too. It's <laughs> the best. <laughs> Welcome to Gom Jabbar, your guide to the iconic world of Dune. We'll be exploring the themes, philosophies, and characters found in the sandy depths of this vast universe, from Frank Herbert's groundbreaking novels to the adaptations on film and TV. My name's Abu. My name is Leo. And Leo, here we are. Yeah. Once again. Yeah. Round and round we go, <laughs> talking about Dune Part 2. There's a lot to talk about. <laughs> So much to talk about, and we're still not done talking about it. So True. yet again, we are diving deep into this film, and today's fun because we took the opportunity to give the film another look through with perhaps a finer tooth comb this time uh-huh. around, and we're excited to bring you, dear listeners, sort of a collection of our favorite little details that you might have overlooked on your first watch <laughs> or second watch or your 17th. <laughs> however many watches that one guy on twitter who's going viral yeah. is on yeah so these will be the tiny little details that we were able to pick out and then of course we'll be sharing the classic gom jabbar larger context of lore from the extended universe on today's episode indeed we will and you know what email us once you get through this episode email us and tell us which of these 12 we share today you also noticed mm. give us a score 10 out of 12 8 out of 12 how many of these did you catch Ooh, good call yeah very fun you know we've we've also officially gone full clickbait you know the the details yes. you missed this is watch That's mojo right. <laughs> you won't believe new rock stars we're uh we're the the newest of the rock stars kate middleton found <laughs> alive found- and well and actually she has cancer oh. Sad. Is that what's happening with her? Yes. Oh. Yeah, it is actually sad. And now everyone on the internet feels bad for all the memes. I was going to make a joke about seeing her in the siege scenes, but it seems unlikely. <laughs> Chemotherapy is <laughs> really hard. It is. It is. Well. Wishing her the best. Wishing her the best on that note. Let's talk about <laughs> uh, housekeeping. Uh, spoiler warning for today. Listen, if you've seen both of Denis Villeneuve's films, you're good to go. We're going to be talking Frank Herbert, first book details, and both of Villeneuve's films. Right. We recommend you read the first book. We have a book club, actually, that we started reposting recently, Mm -hmm. covering Mm -hmm. every page of the first book. And I'm getting feedback from friends pretty regularly. Like, wow, wait, your podcast is good. (laughs) I'm like, fuck you. Yeah. (laughs) First of all, rude. Yeah. And also, (laughs) uh, but that the book club really helps to kind of parse what is important, what isn't important without spoiling and protecting that first read through. So absolutely. If you haven't yet read the book, we recommend it. It's super good. Yeah. And that's a spoiler warning. That's right. Of course, at the top of every show, we must shout out our Kwisatz Haderach level patrons. My God, this show would not be able to continue without all of you. True. Kate Sagan, Daniel, Dion, Roman, Caballo, Jonathan, Lambert, and C.R. Spruill. What an incredible crew. Fellas, we see in Dune Part 2 the giant metal tent of the Emperor lifted up That's right. by the Imperial ship. You are the Imperial ship that lifts us up. Ah. Thank you for your support. Uh, it's like strong metal cables <laughs> hoisting us from our prone, flat on the floor position that we start every day <laughs> into our full, dare I say, <laughs> erect status. Indeed. Thank you for helping us become erect on a daily basis. <laughs> Huge shout out, of course, to our Quizaz Haderic level patrons. But of course, our gratitude extends. Yeah. To all of our patrons and all of our listeners who tune into this show, who support us every single month, no matter what level they're at, yeah, all of that helps us continue this production with the passion and quality that we've always put into it. Indeed. Thank you so much. Yeah. We can afford to keep making the show. We can't afford an HR department, thank goodness, because some of these jokes, <laughs> they get a little heavy. But let's talk about today's episode. This is what you can expect. We found 12 details that we love, easy to miss, kind of even more elevating this thing that we already love, this movie. Yeah. 
And we dug them up, we dusted them off, we gave some extra context for each of them, and we are presenting them to you today. So right. that'll be the bulk of today's episode. Now, I will point out that a lot of this information and a lot of really cool information came from The Art and Soul of Dune Part 2. I've literally got mm. it. Oh, yes. Show right the camera. Here. Show the camera. Because uh, I've been using it oh, for, it's so big. Uh, for research. Yes. This is fucking cool and there is some great and thick behind the scenes photography there's sketches and concept art as well as some cool production details so of course as we were watching the movie we did our best to kind of find these details for you but it was wonderful to have confirmation from the production team of what we were already suspecting so yeah if you like what we're talking about today go check out this book it's super super cool we're not sponsored, <laughs> but I... I was just going to say, you, you bought that with your own hard-earned money, so this isn't any sort of sponsorship. No. It's a genuine recommendation. Yeah, we're not required to say this is sponsored, because it's not, and I am angry at uh, Le, Le Point. Uh, no, Le, Le Point? No, I don't know. Whoever made this book, I'm angry at them. They should give us money, or books, <laughs> right. or something. Yeah, we're open to a sponsorship. We're not saying to no be to clear. a sponsorship, to be clear. <laughs> so willing uh but in any case that is a broad call if you like this stuff i did pick this up i also have the art and soul for part one they're both very cool books yeah very, uh, very neat yeah they are lots of behind the scenes okay well let's take a quick breather leo but don't go anywhere dear listener because when we come back we're diving into our first detail that we wanted to talk about indeed we are welcome back everybody Ah, hope you had a good break. Hope you're ready for 12 details you fucking missed. <laughs> That's right. Watch Watching Mojo. Dune Part. Watch, brought to you by Watch Mojo. <laughs> Our first detail today, Shiga Wire Reels. Hot dog. Love me some Shiga Wire Reels. So, in a couple of brief scenes, we see Irulan recording her thoughts, talking about what she's sort of sussing out, what's happening on Arrakis, all this stuff. Yeah. The machine she's using, we kind of speculated, oh, we don't know if this is a dick to tell. We don't know if this is like a film book recorder. Like there's a few things that it could be, but we get confirmation that this is the Shiga wire reel from Dune, a an actual recording device, which is very, very cool. Yes. So she's speaking into this like microphone and then there's this like, spider leggy kind of machinery thing basically etching her words into this metal cylinder this tube yeah yeah and although we don't know exactly how the reels work in the book again frank famous for dodging details especially on the junk mm -hmm. we want to know <laughs> but we have talked about shiga wire on the podcast before we have and it is defined as a quote metallic extrusion of a ground vine grown only on Seleucus Secundus, and three delta casing. It is noted for extreme tensile strength. End quote. That's right. Now, this material, Shiga wire, is used all over the Dune series. Uh, it's like a cord-like weapon. It's used to bind people and can cut into flesh if you try to struggle against it. Yep. From the Art and Soul of Dune Part 2 book, we actually know that Denis, quote, requested that the prop include a spool on which history could be recorded, end quote. Nice. So this is a, a direct request from Denis. He's like, make it look fucking old. Right. <laughs> uh, time trial tested thing. This is a spool recorded Shiga wire recorder. Very neat. Yeah. It's a fun little detail and lifted or at least inspired from what we know exists in the book itself. Yeah. Because we know messages like this are sent on these Shiga wire reels in in a spool like format, yeah, like a tube. So for the film tube. to not just be like "fuck it," we're just using paper, and to actually commit to building a prop, yeah, yeah, for just like the smallest of scenes throughout the film, props. That's <laughs> that's commitment, you know. That's a props for the props, commitment bro. To the bit. Hell yeah, yeah. Props to the props team, bro. <laughs> All right. So later in the film. We actually get a closer look at one of these Shiga wire reels because there's that message cylinder mm -hmm. that Shaddam opens up and 
It's basically Paul's message telling Shaddam to fuck around and find out, come to Arrakis and see what happens. And of course, we get a shot of Irulan holding it as well. So we get a nice tight shot of it. And of course, because the internet truly never misses, the shot was in the trailer well before the movie came out. And Reddit user Charm Quirk 5 deciphered the message from this one second shot in the trailer, this close up of the cylinder. And this user translated what is clearly Gallic imprinted on the cylinder. Mm. And it reveals that the message itself is a direct quote from the book. It's the message that Paul gives to the captured Sardaukar to go give to the emperor. Quote, I, a duke of a great house, an imperial kinsman, give my word of bond under the convention. If the emperor and his people lay down their arms and come to me here, I will guard their lives with my own. End quote. So fucking rad. <laughs> <laughs> Truly incredible stuff. I mean, I like zoomed in and enhanced that image as well to try and translate it myself just to confirm what this Reddit user did. And I was like, okay, this just looks like gibberish. I don't know what what this is. And the Reddit user is like, oh, it's easy. It's Gallic. And Gallic in the movie is just kind of like a more phonetic-ish made up language and so you kind of you can properly kind of guess what the words are i was like all right man this looks like gibberish to me but i'll take your word for it yeah very impressive stuff and the internet of course doing what it does best once again so shouts to reddit user charm cork five yeah they mentioned that gallic is contemporary english but just phonetically spelled with a different yeah. alphabet so yeah. very very cool uh we'll talk also about the fremen language chicksoba later mm -hmm. and that alphabet is also somewhat findable online so i'm kind of i think it's just a matter of time before we get a lot of translations from set i am wondering how much of it's just like lorem ipsum the design filler <laughs> you know but very cool to know that this prop was actually written out that's so neat that's so cool very what neat. a great little Again, detail such a tiny detail but they lifted an exact quote from the book Very cool. and made it into a prop. Well, that's our first detail. Second detail, Siege Tabur. I, I just want to say Tabra now. Siege Tabra? Tabra. <laughs> uh, Siege Tabur wall writing. Yeah. And all that graffiti we saw in Siege Tabur. No, so this is about the Chakopsa, the Fremen language. And we wanted to talk about in Siege Tabur. Naturally, you know, our heroes arrive. There's all of this writing all over the walls. And the Art and Soul of Dune, part two, makes it clear that, of course, the writing is Chakopsa. We can tell from the types of letters as well. And tells the Fremen legends that have been passed down. Mm. Patrice Vermette himself, I, I want to say friend of the pod because we've had him on, but that feels <laughs> overly familiar. <laughs> we'll have to bring him back. He was quoted in the Art and Soul of Dune, part two. Quote, the Fremen prophecies have been engraved on the walls and written on the floor of their dwellings. End quote. It's actually being understated here. You can see it also written on the ceilings. <laughs> so it's really every of the surfaces has Fremen prophecies written upon it. Now, Conlanger David Peterson is the one who created the language of the Fremen as depicted in the movie. If you poke around the internet, he actually has like whole documents, whole ass documents describing how the Fremen language was created. There's YouTube videos of him creating translations of lines from huh. the story, which is Amazing. very fun because he's like, oh, I haven't come up with that like grammatical case yet. I have to think about how that would work. It's, it's very, very, very interesting. And as a fun little uh, tidbit, the cast actually had to learn their lines in both English and Chikopsa. I imagine these are the uh, the lines that they speak in the frame language. And David Peterson, quote, provided Dini with a list of Chikopsa common expressions to be used if he needed to improvise a scene or a line during the shoot. Amazing. The list included basic words you could use if you traveled to Arrakis, end quote. So cool. There's actually in the Art of Soul Dune Part 2, there's actually a page that actually shows those common phrases of like, hello, no, yes, greetings, you know, things like that. I did not see where is the library uh, listed. So mm. unfortunate, I, I imagine. Yeah, I mean, I took three years of Spanish and that's basically all I know how to say. Biblioteca. Don, donde es? Uh, donde esta? 
La Biblioteca. La, La Bibli yeah, sure. Yeah. And now I really want to know how to say that in Jacob. So. <laughs> Uh, we'll we'll figure it out. Yeah, I'm sure someone will write it out for us and send it to us. Maybe we can just email David Peterson yeah. and be like, "Please, I must know this one weirdly specific thing." I do want to know how much of the Chacopes on the walls is legitimately like written out. Like, yeah, it sounds like I mean, it's on some levels it's become a lot less work because you don't have to have people hand chisel stuff in 2024, but that still sounds like a lot of work. Yeah, I mean, this whole movie. The more and more <laughs> we learn about it, the more I'm exhausted. <laughs> Just watching this movie because yeah. it sounds like so much work. I needed to take a nap 30 pages into this book. Just like, wow, <laughs> I am tired. <laughs> All right, let's move on to our third hidden detail that we wanted to talk about. Honing in specifically on the Fremen tools that we see throughout the movie. Yeah. We've chatted about some of them already in our comprehensive review. That like portable water sucker device, for example, that Chani uses in the opening scene mm -hmm. on the Harkonnen soldiers. But one little detail that was fun to pick out on a rewatch was what the Fremen were using to eat their meals in that one short scene where everyone's relaxing and eating their spicy meals. Yeah. It turns out they are using... <laughs> the Art Art and Soul book confirms this. They are using sporks. Yeah, yeah. And in addition to the fact that they're using sporks, here's the full quote. Because the sporks are critical, folks. Don't you ever fucking lose your spork. <laughs> the quote from the Art and Soul book says, quote, they need to be half fork, half spoon. They will have the same one their entire lives. End quote. Can you imagine the stress of being a young Fremen? You're like, oh, fuck, where the fuck is my... <laughs> Where's my spork? Where's my spork? <laughs> I'm so fucked, man. I'm going to be so hungry. I'm going to eat with my hands. Mom, where did I put my spork? Did you check your laundry pile? But it's once again practical, right? Speaking about Fremen lifestyle in the desert, I think the movie handles this part of their aesthetic very well. A lot of what they do in this movie is simple and pragmatic. Mm -hmm. A lot of their tools, a lot of their methods, a lot of their clothing, right? They wear these like simple linen clothings. The bowls that they're eating out of with these sporks are just very plain and utilitarian. That is very Fremen of them, right? That shows that the filmmakers had a deep understanding of Fremen culture and this necessity to not waste any resources. Right. To only use what is necessary. And some might say an application of Amtal in everyday life. Oh, 100%. Also a reminder that Fremen make their own shit. Yeah. So of course they're going to make like durable, simple things that through Amtal prove themselves to be reliable. That's right. And fail proof. Like a spork. Right. What are you eating? Doesn't fucking matter. Grab a spork. It's the best. Grab a spork. You can eat anything with it. <laughs> you can eat literally anything <laughs> with it. Soup? Spork. spork. Noodles? Spork. spork. Yeah. Quiz me. What What else What else are we eating? Uh, Kimchi? Spork. Boom. Boom. <laughs> Mashed potatoes. Ooh, that's hard. That's really... T spork. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is always spork, y'all. It's the best. Anything and everything. <laughs> Honestly, email us. Name a meal that can't be eaten with a spork. Ooh. I expect zero emails. I, there's got to be one or two, There's right? got to be one. Yeah, someone's going to call me out. <laughs> okay, continuing with our Fremen tools, we did want to share one other quick yeah. quote from the Art and Soul book because it leads to an interesting prop that we see in the movie. Quote, part two introduced new Fremen props. Denny requested, for example, that a new wrist device be designed for the elite Fedakin warriors. It's not a watch, he specified. Perhaps more of a compass? Among the other new technology were Fremen thermo lanterns, which could be used as light sources in the desert mm. in lieu of making fires. End quote. Yeah. So just an example of some other utilitarian and practical tools that we see the Fremen use throughout the film. I did a bit of digging on the watch. Uh-huh. You can actually see it probably most clearly in the cave of birds scene where Timothy Chalamet declares himself Duke. He's very clearly wearing the watch in that scene. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the watch itself, the prop itself, was made by the famous Swiss watchmaker Hamilton, which used to be a famous US watchmaker. I went down this rabbit hole of looking up Hamilton's history. But Hamilton created this wrist compass prop thing for the film, presumably the one that Timothy Chalamet is wearing. And then they released real actual watch versions, like a real thing you can wear on your wrist as a watch that tells the real time. That is, it looks exactly or basically exactly like the one that the Fremen Fidekin wear for the film. 
and it'll cost you just an easy breezy 2000 US dollars. Uh, so if anyone happens to have $2,000 lying around that I could borrow for a little something something, <laughs> let me know. Yeah, unrelated, we're now going to have actually 20 new patron <laughs> Quiz Has Hatterack spots. Uh, so tell your friends and family. Um, oh, 40 more because no, we can't. Yeah, we can't share a watch. Uh, so yeah, still unrelated. Right, we need two watches. <laughs> we need two. Um, it looks like they're only making <laughs> 3,000 of them too. So it's kind of a limited. Yes, it is also like a limited supply yeah. sort of wow. collector's item. I don't think it's one that I'd like wear on a hike. No. <laughs> Probably not. And it, this is almost certainly like a wearable pair of compass, right? Like from Indune lore. Yes. This is going to be very useful for Fidekin to have when they're out mm -hmm. on a raid or something. Absolutely. Well, very cool. Going from the Fremen tools, detail four, let's talk about Fremen outfits because this movie, God, Jacqueline West, costume designer, cooking with gas on this movie. Always. So- in this movie, we get a bunch of cool Fremen kind of outfits. The Fremen drip is unparalleled, especially across the southern scenes. And actually, first on the worm ride, and you were the first to notice this between the two of us, I think in, uh, during the press screening, you had taken note yeah. that the worm that Jessica is on going into the Coriolis storm mm -hmm. is being driven by a Fremen sand rider who has like their own outfit it's this like very heavy plated armored yes. outfit to protect them against the buffeting winds of the storms and i'll also point out the art and soul of dune uh, part two highlights that loading up for that worm ride the props team had a lot of fun making fremen luggage like tons of different like yeah. oversized backpacks right, a lot of them were right. made to look insect like like the carapaces of bugs and uh, essentially like the smaller frem kits, but just much bigger. You're going on a weekend hike. You, you can't do that with just a frem kit. No. It's too no, small. No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> but the Fremen Sand Rider outfit with the Sand Rider shield looks very cool. Uh, we see another couple of examples throughout the movie. Uh, in different worm riding scenes. And then, of course, the Art and Soul of Dune Part 2 has some really cool sketches of how that outfit basically evolved through production mm -hmm. now the southern reverend mothers turning toward the more ornate and decorated are exactly that they are more ornate and decorated than yeah. the other reverend mothers that we see in the movie for sure even reverend romalo of the northern fremen tribes is pretty plain compared to the fucking piles of jewelry and like fine cloths and cool headdresses that the Southern Fremen are wearing. Yeah. And this is a very clear sign of the increased cultural significance that in the South, the Reverend mothers have right in the North. Romalo's dealing with hecklers in the crowd, right? Drinking worm piss, you know, Shashakli and Chani and the other Gen Z Fremen are like, y'all are dumb in the South. These are where the fanatical legions live. This is where the culture is alive and well. This sort of religion is very uh, widely believed. Right. right. This also starkly contrasts the black shawls of the off-world Bene Gesserit, right? Like we see uh, Gaius Helen Moheim in her dark shawl. We see Margot Fenring. We see uh, the sisters that join Margot in the observation booth on Getty Prime. Mm -hmm. The Southern Reverend Mothers are in these like green colors and yellows and beautiful, you know, uh, I think Denny mentioned P Persian rugs in their their styling. It's this beautiful fabric, incredible. Yeah. And literal piles of jewelry. It's really incredible. Yeah. The stark contrast is definitely nice to see, right? Yeah. The, these Reverend Mothers perhaps come from a similar background as the Moheims of the world as the Lady Fenrings of the world, but they are of a Fremen culture. And so to see like the significance they're given in their clothing, and even as you've pointed out, the significance between North and South and how different that clothing style is, is such great visual storytelling. It tells us where these powerful women belong in the context of Fremen society. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. We see them head to toe in these ornate shawls with jewelry and beads and in various colors that aren't just sort of like the beige <laughs> yeah, yeah. or black that everyone else is wearing yeah, on Arrakis. Yeah. It really places them firmly as an important piece of Fremen culture. And it does that without having to say a word of exposition. Yeah. Not to mention, and I'm just kind of putting this together. You think about like, where do a lot of fabric dyes come from in nature? And a lot of fabric dyes are derived from organic materials and like ores and metals and rocks. And if Arrakis doesn't have a lot of those resources, like if you get dyes from plants and berries and bugs and you don't have that stuff in the deep, inhospitable desert, that means that any kind of fabric dyes are going to be very, very valuable and very expensive and yes. hard to get a hold of. So you have like all of the Fremen elders and the knaves wearing, as you're pointing out, these like beige, you know, very minimal garb. And then you have the Reverend Mothers in these like incredible ornate outfits. So you're right. They're sparing no expense for decorating these. And in particular, there's also a great highlight of Jessica in particular. She's got the highest headdress. She's in gold colored cloth and her, you know, beautiful jewelry all over. Uh, she is clearly elevated among even the Reverend Mothers, even these people who are so lauded and so celebrated in the Fremen culture, she is elevated because she is the mother of the Lisa Nal Gaib, right? She is a Reverend Mother, right. of course, a keeper of history and culture, but she is also the mother of, oh, I don't know, potentially the prophet who's going to deliver yeah. us to salvation, or right? Whatever, right. Give her the tall headdress. The, quick. the tallest one they the, could the they one. could muster. Taller, taller, <laughs> <laughs> so tall. In fact, they gave her like a twenty five foot tall one, but they had to. It didn't fit indoors, so she unwieldy. Had to. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she couldn't get through doors. It was awkward. So, so they... uncomfortable. Yeah, it's a lot of weight on the neck. You know. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. That's an that's an excellent point. That she her status once again without a. <laughs> Any unnecessary exposition, yeah. her status is made clear to us as well. She's given the dopest fits. A Fremen's like, strip. come this way, Reverend Mothers, especially Jessica, who's dressed better than the rest of them because they... <laughs> Directed by Brian Herbert. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Visual storytelling. Visual storytelling. <laughs> Movies are just a series of pictures. <laughs> Denis hates dialogue Villeneuve. That's right. That's, that's him. Okay, we have one more detail. So our next detail, this is number five on our list, is another one about the Fremen. So the last thing we wanted to call out about the Fremen today is actually about the Cave of Birds, which, of course, is one of the most stunning parts of the film. Unreal. Visually yeah, speaking. Beautiful. With the lights, you know, kind of the light streams, the god rays coming in through the ceiling and everything. Beautiful set on the outside and inside. But also... Very distinct from Siege to Burr. Siege to Burr is yeah. very angular. It's got a lot of hard corners. And of course, it's got all that Chikopsa writing on the walls, all those legends that we talked about earlier. Right. Yeah. In contrast, the Cave of Birds doesn't have any of that like blocky writing. And instead, there's these swirls. There's these like r round parallel lines sort of like swirling everywhere across the walls. And it's much more... Uh, sort of softer, right? Less hard edges, less like writing and blocks of text and more swirly patterns. And Patrice Vermette, once again in the Art and Soul book, explains that the Cave of Birds, quote, is like being inside a harmonica made of bone. The markings on the walls represent giant fingerprints, the Fremen identity, uh, end quote. So cool oh my god! and goodness. once you know that you can't fucking go back my god if you rewatch the movie and you look at any of the cave of bird scenes it's like oh yeah giant fingerprints they're they're just amazing. literally on giant fingerprints that's what this is so fucking cool what an amazing detail and you know it makes us think of we of course we had patrice on the show for the lego ornithopter interview and during that, we tried to get him to spill some beans <laughs> on Dune Part 2. Yeah. He was very tight-lipped about it, but he did let slip that he in particular loved what they did with the sieges in the film, with the sets of the sieges, and what how they played with Fremen identity and incorporated that into the various sets. And this could be, perhaps, part of what he was talking about. 
the fact that Siege to Burr has an identity of all the writings on the walls, all the legends being etched in stone, and the Cave of Birds has these like fingerprint, another version of Fremen identity on the walls as well. Very cool. Yeah. Now I'm kind of like, we got to email him and get him <laughs> back and be like, can you, you can now spill the beans. It's out there. Yeah, can yeah, you yeah. talk about this? You know, 100%. that would be fun. What is, what has no one noticed, right? Like that's the question of the hour. Yeah. Also, he Very loves fun. karaoke. We'll, we'll we to... need to get him to come to New York. Well, I'll pay for your bus ticket yes. down here, buddy. Train ticket, whatever. <laughs> come on down. Whatever. We'll, we'll sing it up. Yeah. Hell, even a plane, as long as it's well, not Boeing. Oh, you know? <laughs> well, yeah. As long as it's not Boeing. <laughs> we don't want to risk your life. Spirit Airlines at this point has more street cred than Boeing. <laughs> well, let's uh, <laughs> let's jump to our sixth detail. And we are leaving Arrakis for a moment because we're going to talk now about Emperor Shaddam Karino IV. Mm. Now, Dune Part 2 gives us our first view of the literal emperor of the universe played by Christopher Walken. And he is... I've, I've watched now a ton of videos breaking down this movie by people who are very familiar with the book and people who are not. And I think across the board, Christopher Walken is one of the things that I hear most often as kind of a weak point. Yeah. Uh, maybe not even his performance, but the fact that he is so Christopher Walken, like more, more, <laughs> I need more, uh, yep. is so it's yep. distracting. And it takes you out of the otherwise like Javier Bardem is doing so much uh, fucking Stellan Skarsgård sitting in eight hours of prosthetic makeup. And then Christopher Walken walks in. And he's like, ah, I'm the emperor. You know, it's like it is distracting for sure. But, you know, we were talking about it. And I said on this podcast about how. In the weeks following, it started to kind of click with me that you're not supposed to take him seriously. You're not supposed to take the emperor super seriously. He is kind of a facade. He's a mm. he's a shell of power that everyone's afraid of, but maybe not for any good reason. And that really does line up with Dune Cannon pretty well. I felt tr so <laughs> vindicated and validated when in the Art and Soul of Dune Part 2... Denis explains about Walken's performance that he, quote, brought vulnerability and humanity to the emperor who is losing power, end quote. Yeah. Now, this is, to be clear, a huge change from the book. Rereading parts of the book for today's episode, but also just over the last few weeks, the emperor's chapters, Baron Harkonnen says he cannot look away from him. He cannot disregard this person who's walking through the room right? The emperor is this it, like impossible to ignore force of nature in many ways. And so to make him this like vulnerable human person who's losing power is a change that I think is fucking awesome. Now it doesn't address or fix the fact that Christopher Walken was legitimately distracting, right? It is nice to, first of all, be validated in our tinfoil hat theories. You know, it's kind of yeah. out there. I was trying to be an apologist, but turns out kind of nailed it. And also, it is good to know that there was some purpose behind the decision. You know, it's like, okay, for the emperor to be a little bit hard to take seriously. That yeah. I, I prefer that to be a strong choice versus just Denis couldn't work with Christopher Walken because he was undirectable or something like that. Like, that would be a very dissatisfying thing to find out. Right. To know that Denis really appreciated that Walken brought this sort of vulnerability and humanity to the Emperor was good. And I even remember you and I talking about this where it kind of felt like he was hobbling around like this old man. Yep. You're like, is this really the fucking Emperor of the Universe? Right. So that that, that was a distinct choice is very cool. Glad right. to hear. Yeah. At the very least, it was a choice. Yes. And not a, a stumble, you know. Right. Yeah, totally. Well, we have more details for you, but we're going to take a quick break. So don't go anywhere. We've got, well, we've got six more details for That's you. That's right. <laughs> don't stop halfway. <laughs> Come back after this short break. Welcome back, folks. Let's continue with our list of 12 little details you might have missed in the movies. Mm. And up next, we have detail number seven, Irulan's clothing mm. throughout the movie. So speaking quickly about Irlan herself, we thought it was a delight to see her expanded role in this movie, right? Through the runtime of part two, we get a sense that her character was 
a distinct consideration for Denny. She was not an afterthought. She was not relegated to the background and she didn't only show up for one scene like she basically does in the book. She was peppered throughout the movie and played a role. In particular, it's nice to see how Florence Pugh brings a couple of Irland's qualities to life in the film. And the Art and Soul book actually outlines for us that, quote, when Irland is with her father, the emperor, she seeks his approval. When she is with the Benny Jesuit Reverend Mother Moheim, she exhibits wisdom. Mm. And then at the end of the movie, she displays the power of an imperialistic colonizer. And <sighs> that's so cool. That quote is Denny talking about Irland yeah. in the film and how he wanted to present her throughout the course of that journey. I'll also just pause here and say, like, even just that context, rewatching the movie and going back to those scenes, it's fascinating. Yeah. Really, really cool to see that as a sort of like key to her character, that she is yeah. sort of rising to certain challenges or confined within certain boxes of performative behavior based on who mm -hmm. else is in the room, which just right, feels right. so true to women in the Dune universe, but also Irulan as a character who just yeah. is tragic in that she's constantly played as this pawn by other people's right. kind of machinations. Totally. She's really code switching as the need arises, depending on who is in the room and what the situation is. Oh, but she's so good. She's so fucking awesome. We are team. We are, we are absolutely team Irulan. She's great. Yeah. Yeah, she was a highlight of the film for me, for sure. Now, on closer inspection and on rewatches of the movie, what's especially nice to see is the way Jacqueline West emphasizes this arc of Irulan's in the film through her outfits. Yeah, yeah. So, for example, when she is alone riding on her Shigawire real machine thing, she's in sort of like comfortable garb right her hair is uncovered and she's in her element doing her thing as the historian of this story right and she's loose relaxed comfortable clothing totally yeah and then when she's with shaddam and moheim we see her wearing that hair net garment thing yeah and again it's not the most restrictive of things but it is showing that now it's a, she's a bit more buttoned up, perhaps, you know, now, now we have this net across her hair, holding her hair back. And perhaps she, the character herself, holding some of her thoughts and personality back in front of these two people. Right. And West has even said in interviews that this design, this hairnet thing is intentional. It's a reference to Moheim's veil in part one. If you'll recall from the Gamjabar scene, Moheim has that veil, that net veil in front of her eyes. Yeah, she said that she didn't want to, like, fully veil Irulan and fully, like, block out her performance because she is supposed to be this sort of, like, investigator intellect that's driving a lot of the unraveling of this mystery for the audience. Totally. But if you imagine seeing her for the very first time and she's always wearing some sort of ornate beaded headdress mm. and then you see her alone in a room and she's comfortable without that sort of stuff, it's like... All the more so the contrast feels meaningful to me. Yeah, the clothing speaking to the character in that moment and cluing, cluing us in on the emotions and tone. Yeah. Uh, continuing through the film, there are a couple of other moments that are worth calling out in regards to Irulan's clothing. For example, during Margot's report after the Coliseum, after Giddy Prime, uh -huh. Irulan is veiled up. And we get a peek of some of her like imperial finery, right? The things she might wear at like official imperial events, right, 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 right. which we then later see a bit more fully on display when Paul's Shigawire real message tube thing arrives and there's that shot of her holding it. Right. She has this like headdress on that like fully at this point encircles her head. It's not just holding back her hair, but also her face is still uncovered. So it, it almost looks like she's wearing this uh, this like old-fashioned knight's armor helmet. Yeah, or like a wetsuit or something. <laughs> yeah, or like a wetsuit, you know. Clearly more restrictive, clearly more pulled back, and clearly more like imperial in the context of this film. Yeah. And Jacqueline West herself has said that, quote, it evokes the emotion that she's already trapped in that Benny Gesserit plan within a plan world, mm. end quote. It's also like this is one of the first times that we're seeing her in the presence of other attendants and like other 
court people. Right. Right. Like, yeah, we've only seen her alone or like with her father and the truth sayer, who's her like mentor and Benny Gesserit teacher. Great point. This is the first time we're seeing like they're in front of that war monument in, on Khyten and there's like other attendants around. So I get the sense also that this restrictive garb is something that's maybe par for the course when she's out in public being seen by other people all the more so speaking to a sense of uh, imprisonment or uh, restrictiveness in what she's wearing and how she's presenting herself. Yeah, definitely. And I, I've seen a number of tweets and analyses online that speak to a similar idea that throughout the film, we almost see this like progression of how trapped Irulan is mm -hmm. within her clothing, which of course is emblematic of how she becomes trapped in the larger events that are at play. And finally being married to Paul at the end, of course. And, and speaking of that final scene, her clothing here is worth calling out as well, because this one is bold, right? She's wearing this like chainmail dress mm, yeah. with like oh. very sharp looking blades. Like you sit the wrong way and you're going to fucking puncture something. I feel <laughs> like she's fully clothed in this head to toe. And this serves sort of a dual purpose, right? Uh, on one level, it asserts this like medieval power and formidability, right? right? The, the emperor is here on Iraq is to face off against this rogue Atreides boy. And so everyone's here ready to kind of like show off their feathers, you know, yeah. and be like, yo, we're intimidating. We're powerful. Don't fuck with us. Right. And, and this outfit for Irland certainly does that. West even refers to her in interviews as the quote unquote warrior princess right. in this scene. And then West later goes on to explain that, quote, with the very tight beaded headdresses, I wanted to show the Bene Gesserit control over her. So I kept that when I got to her armor outfit, when she agrees to marry Paul and rule over the empire with him. Right. End quote. Right. So sort of that dual imagery of like, yes, intimidating, powerful, medieval. She's wearing this like very dangerous looking armor, but also she is fully enclosed within it. Yeah. Symbolizing that she is trapped within the events that have been set in motion by the Bene Gesserit, by Paul, by the Fremen, by all of these forces beyond her control, by her father even. Right, right. And she uh, has to work within those constraints, within the constraints of this armor, this very pointy armor. Yeah. You know, I initially I was thinking, oh, yeah, she's kind of taking control of the situation. She's saving her father. She's making a choice. But then you think about the scene with Moheim and Moheim's like, there's one way that you are going to be able to do this, right? Th there's no choice there. So she is still very much trapped. She's still very much yep. a piece being played on this kind of galactic chessboard. Absolutely. I've also seen Jacqueline West has mentioned a love of tarot. And then I've seen people talking about like the queen of swords ah, as like a, yeah, again, we did a Dune tarot episode years back. <laughs> Don't know enough to comment on that, but cool to see maybe some imagery being yeah. represented here. That's fun. Well, moving on from that, we have a quick one. This is detail number eight, Baron's Iron Lungs. Mm. Now, when we're on Giddy Prime, we get a chance to really look at these two orbs that we constantly see floating by Baron's side whenever he's not in his balsamic vinegar bath. Right. Now, initially, I was speculating when we were first seeing the trailers that this was sort of like an IV drip. You know, he's wounded, he's, he's unwell, he's sick, he's injured after the tooth incident and so this is a medical device that keeps him alive gets that morphine drip right into his right into his system yeah right but the art and soul of dune references these as a breathing machine and explains that they quote hover at his side to aid his damaged lungs on set the smaller of the two practical spheres expanded with the baron's every breath Oh and quote, gosh. and sure enough, if you go and you watch throughout yeah. every one of his scenes, that smaller of the two is sort of contracting and squeezing. This is a Amazing. literal external lung for him, which is really wild. So cool. Now, the larger sphere just kind of has these pistons that are just kind of always going. Our mathy, nerdy friends, out, our listeners who might be of a mintat <laughs> uh, persuasion may enjoy the fact that the larger breathing sphere is based on a Goldberg polyhedron, polyhedron, poly, polyhedron, uh, which is like a, a sphere created from hexagons and pentagons, 
which is very cool. Kind of looks like a yeah. giant soccer ball to me, but I got my degree in <laughs> art, <laughs> not math. I don't know what's going on. I guess soccer balls are kind of spheres made out of pentagons. Maybe just pentagons. Yeah, I don't know. Pentagons I don't know. I'm not also not a sports the person. Sides of the... <laughs> the worst person to ask. <laughs> right. It's like doubly out of your field. Oh, of... <laughs> it's way out there. Uh, sports and shapes. Let's talk about medical stuff because it's also out of my field, but I do think this is very neat. <laughs> I wanted to kind of throw on the tinfoil hat for a second. We've joked about this balsamic vinegar bath. And even yep. Patrice Vermette mentioned that we asked him right on our episode. I don't think it made the final cut, but we asked him what he, what the bath was. And he yeah. said he didn't know we should ask one of the prop masters, but he said it was like some kind of serum. And it's like, okay, yeah, sure. That's fine. My theory, my tinfoil hat theory, and I think this is supported now by all the evidence is that the balsamic vinegar is some sort of like oxygenated, uh, perfluorocarbon liquid which mm. uh, would be like an oxygen rich liquid that you could actually fill someone's lungs with to allow them to breathe without expanding and contracting their lungs yeah now this is like used in some sci-fi you know this is might how you keep someone in stasis for years and years and years so right bacta tank in star wars yeah exactly so this would actually allow baron to fully submerge himself in the oil let it kind of flood his lungs and then just breathe and have oxygen in his, in his body without having to <laughs> resubmerge and take breaths. I also suggest this because the alternative is he's like squeeze Raban and then he sinks below the surface. And then like 30 seconds later, he comes back up and he's like, right. is he gone? Okay. He's gone. He's down there a cool. long time. Okay, I'm going to go <laughs> back in, you know, <laughs> just yeah. That's true. much less That's true. cool. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, now, now now that we know that the Baron is having breathing problems, yeah. it's not hard to imagine that the baths that he's always taking are in relation to that some way. Yeah, so that that's my that's my sort of tinfoil hat theory, and that those are nice. Baron's iron lungs. Nice. Okay, detail number nine. Yeah, we are making our way through this list. Next up is the Solido console. Yeah, don't know if I'm saying that right. Uh, who knows. <laughs> So throughout the film, we see the Harkonnen command center in Arakeen. We cut back to it time and time again, and we see that really big holographic display with the little red dots that clearly show basically just the conflicts happening across the planet. This is the war room. Mm -hmm. According to the Art and Soul book, this console, this holographic display is called the Solido console, and the operators that are nearby calling out coordinates is actually inspired from, quote, The Six Voyages of Lone Sloan by French comic artist Philippe Druet. I'm definitely not saying that right. Philippe Druet. 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 That feels much closer to the truth. Yeah. Now, I don't think either of us have read this comic or come across it <laughs> nope. at all, but I did do some light Googling and I flipped through some images. And it's a interesting one. Yeah, It's very psychedelic. And my mind immediately, of course, went to a lot of Jodorowsky's yeah, very psychedelic yeah. and weird sketches from his failed Dune movie. So kind of fun to see that there were similar inspirations, perhaps, yeah, for what we saw in the movie, what we saw in Danny Villeneuve's film. Now, in our Discord, this did spark some conversation because some of our listeners felt that this was out of place. In a post Butlerian jihad universe where we don't have advanced computer technology, right, yeah. how do we have this like holographic display that updates in real time what's happening on the battlefield? And that's an absolutely fair <laughs> observation to make. Right, yeah. And it's certainly, yeah, like in a world where we're using swords instead of guns because technology has been so upended by the Butlerian jihad, it makes you wonder, like, what's going on with this display? Yeah. But perhaps an answer to that question could be that this is a House Harkonnen display and we don't see anyone else in the film use something similar. So if anyone is about to be breaking the rules or skirting the rules around technology, yeah. it's easy to imagine that it's House Harkonnen yeah. of all people. I also want to like clarify that there is a distinction here. I think a lot of people will learn about the Butlerian Jihad and this ban on thinking machines and assume, oh, no technology is allowed in the Dune universe. Right. And that's just, that's not true. That's not even supported by the books. 
advanced artificial intelligence and advanced computer technology that mimic the human mind or come close to operating in a way that the human mind does, that is what is banned. And my interpretation of the Solido console, based on my viewings of the film, was, oh, this is just like a holographic projection of satellite imagery. They're like using satellites to track where people are on the battlefield, and then we're getting this cool hologram display. And that sort of technology is not banned in the Dune universe. People talk about weather satellites all the time in the Dune books. So like things like satellites and ships that fly through space, that's all still technology, that's all still some level of com computation. It's just not advanced to the point where it would be banned by the Butlerian Jihad. So I, I yeah. did have a nit to pick with people who <laughs> who were like, "Oh, this shouldn't be in the movie," because yeah, yeah. like uh, to me, it totally makes sense. I the other the other side of this too, and because I, I have a slightly different take on all that. Like w this is twenty thousand years in the future, so the question of like what can be done without computers is something that we can speculate about, but we can't know for sure. Right. And ultimately, you give humanity twenty thousand years, and then in particular, ten thousand one hundred years since the Butlerian Jihad basically like crippled a lot of the universe. Yeah. People are going to figure out shit. Holtzman. Holtzman fucking figured out a bunch of stuff. But you imagine like a, an automaton to someone who only knows about like levers and it looks like magic to someone who, you know, only knows about levers. But right. you go, no, 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 you can crank this thing and that guy will play the piano. It's unbelievable. So I get it. This is absolutely one of the most sci-fi looking things that we get in the entire movie. I can't imagine in today's technology how this would be done without a computer, which absolutely would kind of step on some toes and at least raise some eyebrows and make people very uncomfortable. But we just kind of also have to assume, you know, it's not the technology of today. It's the technology of 30,000 years from now. So, yeah, they have uh, they have radio relays and these guys with the headpieces and everything, they are also inputting information. They're talking about, right. they're, they're uh, relaying, I think it was coordinates. Yeah. So it's all, it's all a little mysterious. You put like one of those little Apple chips in everyone's pocket <laughs> and there you go. You know where they are on the planet and yeah. you track their location. Find my friends. No, there's no AI in This is in find that. my friends. It's a, <laughs> it's just find my <laughs> it's friends. It's a find my app. It's really big. <laughs> uh, Cause Dune, but uh, it's, you know, yeah, I, I think it's a great reminder that like, it's not as simple as no technology. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, cool. Uh, yeah. For anybody who liked the look of that Salido console, check out The Six Voyages of Lone Sloan by Philippe Trouillet, or whatever their name is. Definitely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's talk about smugglers. Detail number 10. 10. We're going to briefly visit the smugglers because there were two details we noticed upon subsequent viewings. First, of course, the smuggler harvester with its fucking pirate sail, goddamn awesome, has an observation bubble, which I think drew a lot of our attention, right? Like, we get this great shot of Gurney Halleck climbing up the, the ladder, he gets out of the bubble, he suspends her down to the ground, but that's actually straight from the book. And here's the quote from the book, quote, in the con bubble of the factory... Gurney Halleck leaned forward, adjusted the oil lenses of his binoculars, and examined the landscape. End quote. So, chalking this up again to a list of things that Denis included in the movie <laughs> that are just like a single word Amazing. or a single phrase right. to bring just a whole new depth to things. Yeah. And the other detail here is Gurney's suit. Now, if you watch the movie, Gurney has this like bum ass looking suit on <laughs> it's just like <laughs> so ragtag scrapped together yeah. it looks like uh yeah if you if you gave me some like duct tape and access to the recycle bin outside of nasa it's something that i would like stitch together it's nothing skilled about this suit looks kind of awful and from the art and soul of dune part two we get this uh description of of gurney halleck quote Wearing a space suit cobbled together from whatever was available <laughs> to allow him to survive in the desert. End quote. Nice. So nice. not only is this great little visual storytelling, as always, Denny hates dialogue, <laughs> Villeneuve, but also <laughs> a kind of demonstration that, yeah, 
the sleek still suits that we spend most of the movie looking at of Paul and Jessica wearing their still suits, all of the Fremen, when Dr. Kynes gives them and puts them onto our heroes in the first movie, Dr. Kynes explains, these are of Fremen make. These are the highest quality you can get. Right. That is not the standard of most people's equipment when they're out in the desert. So this is a another tiny detail, tiny reminder that the Fremen have the best technology on the planet and are very technologically advanced. Yeah, the best desert technology on the planet. Yeah, which, you know, on a desert planet, <laughs> tomato, tomato. Right, it's, right. But I, I just, yeah, I just yeah. imagine the Fremen aren't making like the best spaceships Yeah, because they're not leaving the Who fucking needs spaceships? <laughs> right. Yeah, right. good call, good call. They don't have better Salido consoles, right? No, nah, hell no. Nah. They're like, why would I do that? Uh, will that protect you from <laughs> me stabbing you? Okay, sounds like maybe it's not a very useful piece of technology. Right, right. <laughs> okay, let's talk about detail number 11. We're nearing the end of our list here. The tent, the emperor's tent at the end of this film. So in the book, Shaddam's imperial tent is described as this honestly massive structure. Yeah, oh my God. And it's the temporary housing in the book for the emperor and his Sardaukar forces. They actually plant it outside of Arakeen and not mm. within the city itself. Yeah. Quote, a single metal hutment, many stories tall, reached out in a thousand meter circle from the base of the lighter, a tent composed of interlocking metal leaves the temporary lodging place for five legions of Sardaukar and his imperial majesty, the Padishah Emperor Shaddam IV, end quote. Mm. That's the description from the book. And to kind of give you a sense of scale here, one legion of men is traditionally 30,000 soldiers. So a tent that houses 150,000 of them is going to be fucking massive, not to mention Shaddam and his whole court of attendants and assistance and all of that yeah now in the film we first see the tent below the giant hovering mirrored imperial ship and what's an easy detail to miss the ship is actually attached by these cables to the top of the tent like structure they're in place together and in the art and soul book there's actually these images that show how the tent would actually hypothetically be unfolded. Mm, so basically the yeah. tent is like this telescoping structure that the enormous globe ship is holding up. Like it is helping like prop up and get into place, which is a fun way to interpret that description in the right. book that we just shared. Yeah. It's sort of like how, how Very do you cool. even build something like that so quickly? And it's like fucking easy. Slap that shit down, hook up the cables, just lift and lift it up. Yeah. Right. And then it's fun to imagine that like those interlocking metal leaves, like they're folded up and it's maybe like a very compact tent. And then when the ship sort of lifts it up, yeah. all all of the leaves kind of like <laughs> lock into place yeah. as it gets bigger and bigger. It's a cool, cool imagining of we that. We need the 10 hour ASMR version of that tent being erected. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just an unfolding tent. Yeah. A metal tent. Now, a quick little bonus detail here about the ship itself. Obviously, it is just visually a treat. Watching it come into the atmosphere of Arrakis is one of my favorite shots in the movie. Mm. And the thing that's worth noting is that the Imperial ship has basically the same design as the ship from part one that brings House Atreides the news that they are now going to be taking over Arrakis. Yeah. Yeah. The Legion of the Change arrives in this very round, enormous ship. And here the Emperor arrives in this very round, enormous, and very shiny. I guess the Emperor gets <laughs> perks like having a shiny ship. Chrome. Chrome ship, yeah. Chrome, right. He gets that detailing. You know, everyone else just gets the plain Tinted windows. Ships. It's crazy, yeah. <laughs> it's actually, it actually has hydraulics. So once it gets into place, it can actually bounce. crazy. It bounces. That's yeah, right. That's right. Cool. Yep. Yeah. The, the horn is custom, you know, it's not just Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> right. He, he's really pimped out Oh my ship. God. Someone needs to add that in to Baron and Fade <laughs> looking at his ship arriving, like in the distance, like, da -da 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 -da. <laughs> why is the emperor here? <laughs> it's the emperor's calling call. <laughs> 
so good. And, you know, again, all uh, the, the jokes about the Emperor <laughs> pimping out his ship aside, yeah. it is fun to see that the Harkonnens, the Atreides, and now here the Imperial House Carino have their own individual designs, mm -hmm. not just with their clothing, but also with the ships that they operate. Yeah. You know, every planet looks very different, but it's cool, too, to see that the houses themselves have their own different aesthetics. Yeah, definitely. Now, our final detail today is very cool, very near and dear to my heart, because actually this was partially contributed to by my father. Hello. My pops. Shouts. Shouts to my dad. Uh, but talking about the Baron's death. Now, uh, a couple of details about this that I thought were kind of cool. In the book, of course, Baron Harkonnen dies to Alia Atreides, three, four-year-old toddler, fully aware. Yep. That's right. <laughs> he grabs her in the chaos. He makes sure he goes, I've got her. She's not going to get away. And she pricks him with the Atreides Gom Jabbar, the House Atreides poison high-handed killer needle, and kills, kills the Baron, kills her grandfather with that needle. Yep. In part two, of course, this is very different. Ollie is not born. We didn't get the time jump. So Paul marches into the uh, throne room and walks up to him, holds him by the head, pushes his Chris knife into the Baron's neck. And I wanted to point out first, he stabs the Baron on the same side as the Gamjabar is often held to the neck, right? Right. In Paul's Gamjabar test, in Fade Rautha's Gamjabar test, it's always kind of that point on their neck that the Gamjabar is poised. Yes. So... Paul stabbing him, not cutting his throat, not stabbing him in the heart. It feels like kind of an intentional tip of the hat. I agree. I agree. It also foreshadows Beast Raban being stabbed also similarly in the neck by, uh, by Gurney Halleck. Also, Paul's final kind of word to grandfather, <laughs> Baron's like, what the fuck? Uh, he says, you die like an animal, right? Yeah. Alludes to the human animal dichotomy that the Gom Jabbar test exposes, right? The Bene Gesserit use the Gom Jabbar test to sift humanity, to see if this young duke is human, to see if Fade Rautha is human. Yeah. Paul says, you die like an animal because you die like someone who might jerk away from the Gom Jabbar, the pain box into the high handed needle. Yeah. It's all very cool. This all feels very true to Dune lore and it feels very intentional right. with each of these little set pieces. Right. It feels like Denny's saying, this is still the Baron dying <laughs> to the Atreides Gamjabar. Yes. Just interpreted in a different way. 100%. But there's no reason for him to say you die like an animal if it's not a clear reference to Gamjabar. Yeah, agreed. So there we have it. We are referenced in the, uh, in the movie. Uh, it's us. Can't wait for our paychecks to arrive. Right. Denny basically said, listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. That's what, <laughs> that was Paul's words to Baron. <laughs> Baron's like, rated five stars as he died. <laughs> It's very good. <laughs> very nice of them to throw that in there. So kind. So kind. But here's where I got a text from my dad. And of course, he apologized. Yeah. He's like, hey, you probably already know this. I did not <laughs> at all know this. Amazing. But we get this shot of Baron out in the sand being basically like swarmed by ants. Mm -hmm. And there's a few shots kind of panning over his body. And the one that I think is the most upsetting kind of visually is of the ants coming in and out of his ear. Right. And it's this kind of really dis yeah. dis visceral, gross moment. And my dad pointed this out. I've looked it up online. There's a ton of people talking about it. We haven't gotten any confirmation from Villeneuve or anybody in the production, but I'm, I'm, I personally, I'm just counting down the hours. Uh, this appears to be an exceptionally niche reference to David Lynch. Mm. So let's, uh, let's hear the explanation as a text me message that I received from my father. Amazing. Quote, the final scene with Baron's body... Wait, can you can you do it in your dad's voice, actually? I literally cannot. Uh, <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, no. I've never <laughs> okay. thought of impersonating my dad. Uh, okay, all right. He doesn't have a very distinct voice. Gotcha. He's got distinct gotcha. things to say and a distinct Perfect. vision of the world. Right. The words will speak for He's themselves. He's got a boring-ass voice. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, Dad. <laughs> Just joking. Uh, okay, so here's the quote. Uh, this is my dad's text message. Quote, The final scene with Baron's body in the desert, close up of his ear with ants slash beetles crawling in, in David Lynch's movie, Blue Velvet, 
the opening scene, a boy finds an ear in the grass, a close-up with ants crawling in it. The boy? Kyle McLaughlin. Oh, my God. Who starred as Paul in 1984 <laughs> oh, Dune. God. End quote. First of all, wow. although that text was missing some words here and there, very well told story. Like, it kind of guides you through this discovery. But it's true. Yeah. I looked up Blue Velvet. It's a 1986 movie. It's a David Lynch film. The first four minutes, about the four-minute mark, Kyle McLaughlin, young, <laughs> the first person to ever play Paul Atreides on camera, finds an ear in the grass, and it's shockingly similar. The ants crawling on it and into it and everything. Mm. It is yeah. so similar. It feels so intentional. But of course, again, we don't have any confirmation yet. We did not get any pugs in this adaptation. We didn't get any of the overt, no, sadly. obvious tips of the hat to Lynch's 84. And Villeneuve has said on record that he felt a little bit constrained by the movie and he felt he's not a huge fan of it. But... Villeneuve in other interviews has said he's generally a fan of David Lynch's work. So this could be, and we'll have to wait for confirmation, but this could be a nice tip of the hat. Uh, nevertheless, that's fun from Villeneuve to David Lynch. Wow. Shouts to Papa Wiggins <laughs> for really digging deep on this one. Yeah. 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 And uh, as a reminder, my dad did the art for our podcast. So if you've, he did. if you've admired the uh, Gamjabar logo you've admired his work also if you have any of the john steinbeck books you have my dad's art on your bookshelves so a little humble brag there That's right. my dad's fucking awesome yes we've had the honor to work with a true legend and he would never accept that title. Indeed. But. He also responded I I told him in response that's an astounding bit of information and to which he responded I bugged your mom all the way home about it and then in parentheses pun intended <laughs> that dad humor it's, it's universal so incredible <laughs> wow amazing and that's our episode. wow amazing what, what a great uh final little detail to end on and that's it that is our complete list of 12 details that we wanted to talk about that you dear listener may have missed on your rewatches of the film indeed we hope it enhances your next rewatch of the film and of course, we want you to shout out any details that you've noticed as well. Totally. Obviously, there's much more. This is hardly a comprehensive list. And we definitely cut a few out that we wanted to get to but didn't have time for. So please email us your thoughts as well. And of course, right. let us know of these 12 that we shared today. How many did you already know? How many did you find without our help? <laughs> yeah. That's true. It's like a little BuzzFeed quiz, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, before we let you go, dear listener, we want to remind you quickly of a couple ways to support us and keep in touch with us. And the two best ways to support us is to become a patron and get some Dune themed swag from our merch store. That's right. Now, those links are in our show notes. Check them out again as a patron for as little as two dollars a month. You can help us continue to make this podcast. And uh, of course, I am personally, I will go on record here. I am planning in the next couple of months uh, to put together some new merchandise. So Fun. keep your ear to the ground regarding Ooh, that stuff. A little tease. Yeah, I know. Still suit full of piss. Am I right? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> definitely let us know. Uh, you can also email us gomjabarpodcast at gmail.com. Of course, let us know if we missed any details that you saw. Yeah. But also if there are uh, ideas that you have that you think would be really cool as merchandise, I'm happy to make it happen. Um, I've seen some stuff, even some officially licensed stuff that I think looks fucking awful. I have a degree in art. I'm not bad at putting shit together. So hit us up. Gomjabarpodcast at gmail.com. Send us your thoughts, your questions, cute pet pictures, That's and right. all those details we That's might have right. missed in Dune Part 2. Uh, Leo, cereal? Uh, spork. spork. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, spaghetti. Spaghetti, spork. Okay. A bowl of fruits. Yeah. A bowl of just fruits. Just any, like like watermelon. Any fruit. Spork. Spork. Uh, coconut. Coconut. Spork. Yeah, I think so. I think so. That would work. That would work perfectly, dare I yeah. say. Um, ooh, something. I'm really racking here's, my brain. Here's a really, really hard one. Really hard one. Okay. Okay, you ready? Yep. You ready? Oatmeal. Mm -hmm. 
Spork, baby. Damn. I thought I stumped Scoop you that on that oatmeal one. right into my mouth. Nope. Nope. I knew instantly exactly the utensil I'd use to perfectly transfer that nutrient into my body. Jägermeister? Spork? What's a Jägermeister? Jägermeister is a type of alcohol. <laughs> oh. You know what? Spork it up. Yeah, spork it up. <laughs> spork it up, baby. Yeah. <laughs> We're doing a samosa a samosa spork we're doing spork. a boozy brunch with our sporks <laughs> <laughs> well friends there is no real ending it's just the place where you stop the recording but this podcast is always one step beyond logic so help spread the word of muadib and leave us a review on apple podcasts and spotify lisa nagaib and be sure to check out the other shows on the lord party podcast network on lordparty.com you can also follow us on twitter and instagram at lore underscore party we're also on tiktok at gomjabar podcast thank you so much for listening and remember whoever controls the podcast controls the universe we'll see you on the golden path